In this video, we're going to be talking about aerobic exercise and how our body transitions into starting aerobic exercise. So going from rest to exercising, then going back from exercising to rest. So we're going to be talking about the concepts of oxygen deficit and EPOC, which is excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. All right. So before we do that, though, we need to start off by just kind of talking about rest because we're going to be going from rest to exercise. And so at rest, almost 100% of the ATP, which is our unit of energy that we our body uses, so almost 100% of our ATP is going to be produced using aerobic metabolism. So very little anaerobic metabolism is happening at rest. Um, so our blood lactate levels are going to be very low because um, that's something that builds up with uh, large amounts of glycolytic metabolism, um, which is an anaerobic pathway for metabolism. So at rest, uh, less than one millimole per liter of blood is normal. There's always going to be a little bit, our uh, red blood cells, for instance, um, do not have the ability to use aerobic metabolism. So there's always a little bit of lactate being produced by the red blood cells. So it's obviously in the blood and it will be measurable. And at rest, our oxygen consumption level is going to be 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute. Um, and which is, uh, you should recognize as equaling one met, so one metabolic equivalent of task, which is a common metabolic unit uh, for exercise prescription type of activities. So let me orient you to this figure that we're going to be using here. So we have time on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have either VO2, so oxygen consumed for aerobic metabolism, or ATP use, and the, these are color coded here. So uh, looking though at the time for just an, another, another moment here, um, the zero line is where we start exercise. So all these negative values counting back from zero, are, it was rest, so it's the baseline period before they started exercising. And then we count up from there. Um, then looking back at the y-axis again, we have this dotted blue line here, which is our aerobic metabolism line, basically, so our oxygen consumption line. Um, and what they're doing, um, just to kind of tell you about the exercise, this is some sort of aerobic exercise, uh, think like a treadmill exercise or maybe an exercise bike, where they're increasing their exercise intensity every three minutes or so. So you can see that the oxygen consumption goes up with each increase in exercise intensity. Then we have the ATP use, which is this sort of brownish colored line that's um, kind of hard to see because it goes behind some of these other lines, but it's the top squared off line that I just traced. And that is how much energy our body needs to use in order to accomplish each of these intensities of exercise. Um, so um, we also have some shadings going on. So the light blue is aerobic, or aerobic energy production. The light reddish sort of pink color is the anaerobic, so without oxygen, energy production. And we'll talk about uh, these periods of epoch on the next slide when we talk about epoch. So, uh, but let's go ahead and get to talking about this uh, and looking at some of these bullet points. So first of all, as soon as you start to exercise, your ATP production and also your ATP usage is going to uh, ramp up. So there's no delay in how uh, quickly our body uses energy or produces energy. It immediately increases, which is the reason why this line, as soon as you start, let's say, going you know three miles an hour on a treadmill, your energy usage and energy production is immediately going to meet the needs in order to do three miles per hour on a treadmill. There is no delay. If there was, you wouldn't be able to do it. You'd fall off the back of the treadmill. So as soon as we start exercising, this line just goes straight up to whatever the, the need is for the exercise intensity. And that's going to happen with each exercise intensity until the person can't keep up with the treadmill anymore, can't produce the energy. And then again, they'd have to stop exercise or fall off the back of the treadmill. Um, the initial um, energy produced. So notice when we go from rest, we're again at rest, we use almost entirely aerobic energy. When we start to exercise, there's this period where we have this red shaded area, which was the anaerobic energy produced. Um, and then eventually the aerobic line kind of curves up and catches up and is able to meet the needs of this intensity of exercise. But before it does that, before you're able to produce the energy you need aerobically, we have to produce it anaerobically. And while we're in oxygen deficit and, and we're using anaerobic energy sources, we're using the ATP phosphocreatine system, we're using glycolysis, and that's 
going to happen every time we increase the exercise intensity. It happens for a period of time until the aerobic metabolism ramps up and catches up to where it should be in order to fully fuel the exercise intensity at that level. So during this lag time where we're, where we're producing this oxygen deficit, this O2 deficit, um, and we're using glycolysis and we're using phosphocreatine, we're actually burning through some of those resources, um, which is not such a great thing. And we're also potentially producing extra lactate and extra hydrogen ions, which is, our, which is acid, um, because we're not using aerobic metabolism. All right, so we wanna try to minimize our oxygen deficit Good news is trained individuals do have lower oxygen deficit levels than untrained individuals. So this is one of the things that does improve with cardiorespiratory exercise training. So this, this red shaded oxygen deficit period or uh, area would actually be smaller in a trained person than an untrained person. However, the greater the exercise intensity, the greater the oxygen deficit is going to be because the longer the lag time is going to be for aerobic metabolism can actually get to where it needs to be. So we see a small oxygen deficit with this first fairly low intensity exercise and we go up to more of a moderate intensity exercise, the oxygen deficit gets a little larger because it takes a little longer for this to slope up and for aerobic metabolism to fully meet the needs. And if we get too intense, aerobic metabolism won't actually be able to fully meet the needs. And so the oxygen deficit, deficit doesn't actually go away because we never fully become 100% aerobic at those levels. And that's going to continue as you go up and up in intensity until the point where you can't continue anymore and you have to stop, which would basically be your VO2 max, whatever the oxygen uh, consumption was at that point in time. So let's now talk about the period of recovery. So after we stop exercising, so here's the, the stop exercise point in time. So at nine minutes in, this person stopped and they just sat down and didn't exercise anymore. We don't just suddenly stop breathing heavy. We don't suddenly ramp down our, our aerobic metabolism level to immediately back to resting levels. It, it continues and it, it's, it's higher than rest for an extended period of time. And so this higher level of oxygen consumption than what we would normally need at rest is what we call EPOC or excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. So it's the extra breathing you do after you stopped exercising during your recovery period. And so the greater the exercise intensity, the greater the EPOC is going to be. So high exercise intensities, high levels of EPOC. And this is also something that's going to be improved a little bit with uh, exercise training. So looking at this diagram a little closer here, we have two different shaded areas of EPOC. So we have this purple checkered area of EPOC and we have this blue hashed area of EPOC. Purple area is the rapid component. The, hashed, the blue hashed area is the slow component of EPOC. And each one of these is created so the extra oxygen consumption, the extra breathing and ventilation is caused by different factors. So let's talk about the rapid component first uh, over here. So um, one of the main things we're doing during the rapid component is we're resynthesizing our phosphocreatine stores. Because remember, when we're doing these anaerobic periods uh, where we're developing this oxygen deficit, we are using a lot of phosphocreatine in order to fuel exercise, especially um, here at the you know the very beginning of the increase to the new exercise intensity, um, and so we need to refuel uh, that those phosphocreatine stores, and we do that aerobically, producing ATP aerobically that will reverse the phosphocreatine reaction. A small portion of the epoch period is related to actually restoring oxygen levels in our muscle and blood. So about 20% of the epoch, uh, the total epoch period, um, is going to be from just repaying the sort of oxygen deficit because our oxygen levels do uh, drop a little bit um, with high intensity exercise. So again, we repay that during this uh, rapid component period of EPOC. All right, so now let's talk about the slow component of EPOC here. Um, the slow component is not repaying oxygen deficit. It's not rebuilding phosphocreatine. It is now related more to our high metabolism that happens after exercise because of hormonal changes that happen during and immediately after exercise. So we have elevated epinephrine levels, elevated norepinephrine levels, which if you're not in the United States, epinephrine is adrenaline, norepinephrine is noradrenaline. They're the same things, just different names for them. So these 
um, these levels are elevated after exercise. And there's also some other um, metabolically active hormones that are elevated after exercise. And this is going to mean you have high metabolism, specifically high aerobic metabolism, um, which is going to drive the breathing rate to be higher than what it was before you exercised when you were also resting. Um, we also need to convert our um, lactate that's in our muscle that's you know oozing basically out into our blood into glucose through gluconeogenesis. And this is a process that does require some um, oxygen in order to do that conversion and also to convert it back to pyruvate within different uh, cells of the body in order to use it aerobically. So we need to deal with the lactate, in other words, and doing that requires extra breathing and ventilation. Um, and also we have elevated heart rates, we have elevated breathing rates, and that requires work, right? So uh, breathing is work for our body, and so we need to fuel those muscles that are doing that work. We need to fuel the heart that's beating a little faster than it was before exercise. And doing this is going to require additional energy, which we are going to provide aerobically. So it's going to help prolong this period of EPOC. And so this can go out for, it's shown here up to 15 minutes. It can go out further than that, um, primarily because of the hormonal changes that happen during exercise. So in this video, we are primarily talking about um, the onset and the end of aerobic-based exercise, um, but not all exercise is aerobic-based. In whether we use aerobic metabolism or anaerobic metabolism, what type of anaerobic metabolism is going to depend on the intensity and the duration of that exercise. So the next video um, in this series, which I'll be linking to below uh, in this uh, in the description below this video, will be on the energy source, the energy pathways that are the primary energy pathways for various um, lengths of exercise for for intense exercise. In this video, we're going to be talking about the various energy pathways and which one's the primary energy pathway based on the duration of exercise during intense exercise. All right, so um, looking at this figure here, we have uh, time on the x-axis and this, uh, this x-axis is not uniform across. So um, we go from three seconds to 15 seconds to 60 seconds to 120 seconds, and then jumping all the way to two hours. So this is not a uniform you know, linear timeline here. Keep that in mind. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have energy production rates, so how quickly we are producing energy in the exercise performance level. All right, so uh, looking at these lines, we have uh, this dotted black line is the actual exercise performance level. And then these various lines represent the different sources of ACP production or, or availability. Um, and so I'm going to be linking this figure to this table, which kind of summarizes the, the key points. All right, so the first one to three seconds is going to be primarily using our stored up ATP. So this is ATP that was produced before and it was just sitting and available in our muscles. So we burn through that with intense exercise in between one and three seconds typically. Um, after we start burning through that, we need to immediately replace that energy. And so we do that with phosphocreatine. So when this um, a source of energy, so the, the, the available stored ATP starts to run low, we switch to phosphocreatine. So from three seconds to 15 seconds, that, that period of time, that epoch, um, which that's what epoch means is the period of time, is going to be primarily fueled with phosphocreatine. So looking at the figure here, we can see it ramps up immediately as the, the green line is going down, which is the stored ATP line. And it stays high up until around 15 seconds where it pretty quickly diminishes. And that's when we start running out of phosphocreatine. And anytime we run out of an energy source, we have to then transition to the next energy source. Um, and so the next energy source is going to be glycolysis. And we're specifically talking about glycolysis here that is going to end in um, uh, lactate. So it's an anaerobic style glycolysis, not glycolysis ending in pyruvate that will go into aerobic metabolism. We'll get to that, but we're not there yet. So here is our um, glycolysis line. It ramps up as the, our phosphocreatine line quickly ramps down and becomes the dominant energy pathway. Keep in mind, I'm talking about dominant or primary energy pathways. None of these are active by themselves and 100% in charge of sort of fueling exercise. 
they're all active all the time. It's just which one is the dominant because they do kind of hand off um, that primary role. Anyways, so as we switch from phosphocreatine, which is a immediate, really fast energy source to glycolysis, exercise intensity has to come down because we can't produce energy as quickly with glycolysis as we could with phosphocreatine. And um, as we sort of transition even further, so glycolysis, um, anaerobic glycolysis, is going to be the primary energy pathway for 15 to 45 seconds. Um, after 45 seconds, it's going to be a steady shift from anaerobic glycolysis to aerobic glycolysis, uh, where we're going to start ramping up our, uh, our Krebs cycle and our electron transport chains and using that pyruvate that is the end product of glycolysis whenever we have aerobic metabolism being active. And we are quick, we're going to be shifting again from anaerobic to aerobic energy um, during the next um, you know, minute or so here. So from 45 seconds to 120 seconds. Um, giving an example here at the 60 second time point, uh, which is right here on our figure, about 70% of the energy is coming from anaerobic style glycolysis and about 30% of the energy is coming from aerobic metabolism, primarily coming from glycolysis and using up the pyruvate as the end product of glycolysis, again, through the, the aerobic pathways. Going out to 120 seconds, so going from one minute to two minutes here, this is the point where aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism cross each other. So we um, are now using 50% anaerobic and 50% aerobic metabolism at two minutes, um, keeping in mind that the aerobic metabolism is still primarily uh, using the end products of glycolysis, so the pyruvate and the um, various uh, electron carrier molecules that can come from that process in order to fuel the aerobic metabolism. As we go beyond 120 seconds, so beyond two minutes, we are primarily using aerobic metabolism, and it's going to be a mixture of fat and carbohydrates. Higher intensities are going to be favoring carbohydrates. Lower intensities will be favoring fats. Um, so it'll be a mixture of the two, um, but if we're talking about higher intensities, primarily still carbohydrates, up until about two hours where most people start to run out of carbohydrate stores and are forced to use a lot more fat. You know, this is that point where in a marathon, people talk about hitting the wall around two hours. That's because that's when they're running out of carbohydrates. And looking at this exercise performance line here, each time we do a handoff and we're progressing down these various energy pathways, exercise performance is going to suffer. It's going to go down further and further. So let's talk about why that is exactly. I've already kind of mentioned it, but let's show it a little more concretely here. Um, so this figure has phosphocreatine, glycolysis, which is ending in lactate, so it's the anaerobic style glycolysis, glycolysis, and ending in pyruvate that goes into the aerobic pathways. Um, so aerobic glycolysis, and then we have aerobic fat metabolism here. And we have two different lines. We have a purple line, which represents the energy liberation rate. So how quickly we can get energy out of that pathway. And we have the green line here, which is the total energy available in that energy pathway. All right. So uh, looking at the bullet points here and kind of lining all this up, phosphocreatine is an immediate energy source. We can produce a lot of energy really, really quickly. So we pull a lot of energy out really, really quickly. But there's very little energy in our muscles that is stored as phosphocreatine. So even though we can make energy really quickly this way, we just don't have a lot of it. So we're going to run out of it really quickly. All right, so going to anaerobic style glycolysis, this is also pretty quick. It's not nearly as fast as phosphocreatine, but it's still pretty quick. Um, and so our, our ability to get energy out of it, again, happens quickly. And this looking at the purple line here. It's Still not a ton of energy there, though. We, we're going to quickly run out of our ability to run anaerobic glycolysis. So as we build up um, our lactate and uh, build up acid levels in our blood and our muscles, we are forced to slow down and we're able to use glycolysis more aerobically. We can fuel our bodies, though, for about two hours on aerobic style glycolysis. Um, so most people who are highly trained runners who are running marathons, most of that race is going to be uh, using aerobic style glycolysis. So again, up to about two hours. Um, 
the speed of energy coming out is going to be much less than if we're uh, running glycolysis faster and doing it anaerobically, and certainly much less, uh, much slower than phosphocreatine. But the total energy we can get out of it is obviously much greater than what we can through anaerobic glycolysis or phosphocreatine. Um, moving on here to fat metabolism, uh, so aerobic fat metabolism, so all fat metabolism is done aerobically. Um, this is a much slower process, so the speed of energy liberation is much slower than everything we've talked about up to now. So you can see this purple line just kind of marches down, downward. However, how much energy, the total energy we have available to us that we can pull out of these systems is marching upward as we go down you know, to the right and towards that aerobic metabolism here. And in fact, a normal individual who is well fed, um, who's not in like a starvation uh, state, they're going to have enough body fat to do nearly limitless amounts of exercise. Now, of course, someone can overdo exercise and run into problems, but you know, assuming that they're well trained, they're well fed, they're being uh, maybe even fueled along the route, somebody can exercise for hours, days um, using fat metabolism. So think about ultra marathon running. People will literally run for days at a time, you know, stopping to sleep maybe a couple hours here or there if they need to. And so aerobic fat metabolism, huge amounts of energy a bit available. It's just very slow to come out. So clearly there's a difference between the types of activity that's going to give us uh, a lot of aerobic metabolism versus the types of activity that's going to be more anaerobic metabolism, and then you know everything in between. There's, there's various ratios of the two. Um, so let's look at um, some examples here. Uh, so aerobic versus anaerobic energy contribution. On the, on the, on the y-axis here, we have percentage of the total energy used for the activity that is either aerobic, the green line, or anaerobic, the purple line. And we have the duration of that activity on the x-axis. So we've seen some of these types of numbers before. So one to three seconds, think about you know Olympic style weightlifting or powerlifting, very quick activities, you know, a few seconds long typically or less. Um, those are going to be almost entirely the anaerobic and almost no aerobic energy being used. As we increase the duration here, so as the duration of time becomes longer, we use more aerobic and less anaerobic energy. Um, and to the point around two minutes where the two cross each other, which we've already kind of talked about on the previous slide. Um, but at that point in time, it's 50-50 aerobic, anaerobic. Beyond two minutes, it's more aerobic than anaerobic. Um, so looking at a few um, examples that are typically right around that crossing point, would be like an 800 meter run, maybe boxing. And once we get past that, maybe a 1600 meter run or a mile run, um, 2000 meter rowing, um, going a little further out, more, even more aerobic and even less anaerobic. 5K uh, running, uh, whether it's cross country or track or uh, road running, um, you know, cross country skiing even further out up to about two hours or so, marathon running, various other activities as well. Much of that is going to be aerobic and very little anaerobic at that point, just because we just can't be anaerobic and maintain it for that duration of time. So the longer the duration, the more we're going to be favoring aerobic, the shorter the duration or the higher the intensity of exercise, the more we are going to be favoring anaerobic energy. Um, if, the energy if the exercise is very intense and um, we try to push it beyond a short duration, we're gonna run out of energy in each pathway and be forced to slow down with fatigue as I showed a couple of slides back um, with the, the sort of handoff that happens from phosphocreatine to glycolysis to more aerobic glycolysis to eventually in fat metabolism, which is also aerobic. So we talked a lot about different energy pathways and anaerobic versus aerobic energy sources and hinted a little bit at the difference between when we're using carbohydrates versus fats. But in the next video, I'm going to be going into even more detail of when we're using fats, when we're using carbohydrates. So I'm going to go ahead and put a link to that video in the description below this video.
in order to understand how we need to fuel our bodies and how our bodies are actually using our fuel in order to power our exercise, we need to talk about how exercise intensity and duration and things like that are going to affect the energy substrates we use. So we're going to be specifically talking about carbohydrates and fats in this video. So looking at this graph here, we have a percentage of your VO2 max on the x-axis. So 100% is your point of your VO2 max. And we have you know various sub-maximal exercise intensities before that. And on the y-axis here, we have the relative energy contribution um, as a percentage of the total 100% um, that we get from carbohydrates versus fats. And you can see that there is a point in time where we cross each other. So there is this sort of crossover transition point. And so initially we're using mostly fats. And as exercise intensity goes up, we start to use mostly carbohydrates. So low intensity exercise, specifically below 30% of your VO2 max, is going to use fats as its primary energy source. Around 30% or so, 30 40% is where we're going to transition from using mostly fats to using mostly carbohydrates. So um, if we go even higher, so once we get to around 70% of your VO2 max, so fairly high intensity exercise at this point, now carbohydrates are clearly going to be the primary energy pathway. So now we're right around here at 70%. So again, clearly mostly carbohydrates and not a whole lot of fat metabolism going on here. Um, and so why does this happen? Why do we have this crossover transition point from fast carbohydrates? The primary reason is fat metabolism is just too slow. So fat metabolism cannot keep up um, with the exercise intensities at these higher intensity levels. So we need to use faster energy sources. And so that's going to mean uh, glycolysis uh, ending with aerobic metabolism, but also eventually if the, in if the intensity goes high enough, glycolysis ending anaerobically, in which we cannot use fats anaerobically. We have to use fats aerobically. Some other reasons why we, we have this transition from carbohydrates to fats is going to be which muscle uh, fibers, so which muscle cells are going to be recruited to do that exercise. So as we start to do higher intensities of exercise and needing more powerful contractions out of our muscles, we start using more fast twitch muscle fibers. So those type two muscle fibers, um, type two A's, type two X's, etc. And those muscle fibers are not so great at aerobic metabolism, especially you know, fat metabolism, which is has to be aerobic. And so we end up using more carbohydrates because those uh, muscle cells uh, primarily use carbohydrates. We also have this progressive increase in hormone levels, things like epinephrine, which is going to increase the rate of glycogen breakdown and increase gly glycolysis. And so we end up using more carbohydrates and less fats. So we can't get through this video without talking about protein as an energy source. Fats and carbohydrates are our primary energy sources. Um, our bodies don't like to use protein, but it can. Um, so we can break down um, proteins through protein catabolism to release amino acids. And then we can metabolize those uh, amino acids in the, in the muscle and use those in various aspects of uh, aerobic metabolism. We can also um, use those amino acids and send them to the liver to be converted to glucose through gluconeogenesis. And then that glucose can be used just like glucose that was consumed as glucose or as, as some form of carbohydrates. So we can use protein for energy. Um, and we use a little bit all the time, but um, we, again, we don't use a lot. So typically about 2% of our total energy is coming from protein, which is not a lot. Um, if we um, progress the exercise for a longer duration, so think long distance running, cycling, those sorts of activities, um, then we can get a, a little bit more protein uh, catabolism happening. And protein can eventually be somewhere between 5 and 10% of your total energy uh, substrate utilization. So, um, but that's still a fairly low number. Part of why this is, is some of the enzymes, um, the, the proteases that uh, break down protein and do the protein catabolism are activated by long duration exercise. Again, think long distance running, long distance cycling, those types of activities.
We also can't get through a video like this talking about using fats versus carbohydrates without talking about the fat burning zone that people love to talk about. And it's you know printed on a lot of um, machines and posters at gyms and things like that. So we can see an example here of some uh, various heart rate zones and there's this fat burning zone. It's usually fairly low intensity of exercise. So in this example, the heart rate's 92 to 98 beats per minute is what this particular machine was rep recommending for the fat burning zone for this person where um, the VO2 max they were saying was more up around maybe 186 beats per minute for this person. So really low intensity exercise is the fat burning zone. And it's true, there is a fat burning zone. There's a point in time where we use primarily fat for exercise. We've already talked about that a little bit in this video. So let's look at 20% of VO2 max and 50% of VO2 max as a couple of uh, example exercise intensities. So at 20% of VO2 max, about 60% of your total calories is coming from fat. So well within the fat burning zone. So it's majority fat being used. If we look at the 50% of VO2 max here, we have... Uh, about 40% of our calories coming from fat, the rest of them coming primarily from carbohydrates. But now we're burning about twice as many calories. That gives us about 80 calories of fat versus the 60 calories of fat burned doing the 20% of VO2 max for the same you know, length of time. So we actually burn a little more fat at the slightly higher intensity than we did at the lower intensity. Now this increase in fat usage isn't going to continue as you get to more and more intense exercise and well into vigorous intensity exercise, but it doesn't need to either because you don't need to be burning body fat during exercise in order to lose body fat from exercise because our body, a calorie is a calorie. Our body has the ability to convert from one um, energy to another. If we consume a bunch of carbohydrates, it's going to be converted to fat and stored as fat. Um, if we use a lot of carbohydrates during exercise and then we eat our meal that we would have eaten anyways, yes, it's your body is going to replenish those carbohydrates first, but those carbohydrates that are replenished are not now going to be stored as fats. It's not gonna be excess carbohydrates anymore. So you're still going to be burning the same amount of fat eventually as your body sort of shifts things around as you eat your replenishment meal, which you're going to do eventually anyways. So it doesn't matter if you're burning mostly fats during the exercise or mostly carbohydrates. Or again, a calorie is a calorie when it comes to weight loss. You just want to burn more calories so that you can lose more body fat eventually as our you know our body balances things out and shifts things around. So we don't need to necessarily worry about this whole fat burning zone. It's it's basically a myth. Yes, you burn more total percentage of your, your fuel as fat at lower intensities, but that doesn't matter in the end. What matters in the end is losing body fat. And you do more of that at higher intensities per unit of time that you exercise, of course. You can do this fat burning zone and exercise for you know, twice as long, but who wants to do that if if you're capable of exercising at a slightly higher intensity? Why waste your time? Why not get it done in a shorter period of time? And also, higher intensity exercise is better for improving your cardiovascular system. It's better for improving lots of different aspects of your fitness. So there are lots of benefits to increasing that intensity when you can. Um, I'm not saying you have to, but there's also minimal benefits to keeping your exercise in this fat burning zone if you don't have to. So we ended this video talking a little bit about different exercise intensity levels and um, whether you'd be able to increase your exercise intensity uh, beyond uh, you know fat burning zone or beyond moderate intensity and into vigorous intensity exercise. And that's going to depend on your fitness level and various uh, factors related to your fitness level. I'm going to put a link in the description below to a video um, where the next video in this series where I'm going to be covering um, your aerobic capacity as well as some other aspects of fitness that are going to determine what your maximal exercise intensity is going to be that you can maintain for a period of time. In this video, I'm going to be talking about aerobic capacity. So we're talking about VO2 max, and we're going to be talking about your anaerobic thresholds, things like lactate threshold, and how those things interact with each other in order to determine your ability to exercise um, aerobically and to continue to do it for a long period of time without fatiguing. Let's start off by talking about VO2 max or aerobic capacity. Uh, so this fairly simplistic diagram here has uh, work rate increasing, uh, progressively increasing on the x-axis, 
And on the y-axis, we have VO2 or oxygen consumption progressively increasing as well. And so when you look at these two together, as you increase your exercise intensity starting at rest to, through some maximal exercise, all the way to your maximal ability to exercise, your VO2 or your oxygen consumption progresses at a fairly linear rate. It's not perfectly linear, but it's fairly linear, uh, which just means a straight line like this until the point of your VO2 max, and then it tends to sort of curve over and plateau. Um, but that is the point of your VO2 max. That's as high as you're able to um, go with your aerobic metabolism, which is why we call it the aerobic capacity. You always hear people, especially you know, endurance athletes, wanting to increase their VO2 max and increase their aerobic capacity. Um, what are the things that are going to limit your aerobic capacity and limit your VO2 max? So it's going to be limited by your cardiorespiratory system's ability to get oxygen out to the body, specifically to the muscle. And it's going to be limited by your muscle's ability to bring in the oxygen and use it aerobically within the mitochondria in order to produce ATP. So these are two different things um, that are going to have to work together in order to use oxygen to make ATP or to make energy. And this is going to be heavily influenced by both your genetics and your training. So the VO2 max is widely considered to be the single best indicator of cardiorespiratory fitness, um, which is closely related to athletic performance in endurance-based uh, athletics like distance running, but it's not necessarily exactly the same. Um, and so there are other factors that aren't included in the VO2 max assessment that we also need to be um, aware of in some shortcomings of the VO2 max. So some of the shortcomings of VO2 max is that it does not assess anaerobic performance. And anaerobic ability is important for endurance-based athletes as well because they do use a fair amount of anaerobic energy, especially when they first start and when they end a race or any time during the race where they might give a little spurt in order to catch up somebody or pass somebody. Um, the VO2 max also does not take into account the exercise economy. So what are the characteristics a good endurance athlete is going to have? So of course they're going to have a high VO2 max. They're also going to have a high anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold being one version of an anaerobic threshold. Um, they're also going to have really high exercise economy, so they're going to be really good at doing the activity without wasting energy with extra movements and things like that. And uh, for endurance athletes, you want a high percentage of your muscle fibers to be type 1 slow twitch muscle fibers. All right, so to show an example here of why, specifically why the, the anaerobic threshold uh, or the example of an anaerobic threshold, the lactate threshold, is so important for endurance-based performance. Let's look at this diagram here. So very similar diagram to the previous slide. We have increasing work rate on the y-axis or on the, on the x-axis, and we have uh, increasing VO2 or oxygen consumption on the y-axis. And we have two different people. We have the one in purple and the person in green. So this purple individual has a 17% better VO2 max than the green uh, person here. And so they're going to be able to progress in this VO2 max test a little bit further, um, suggesting higher fitness levels. However, their lactate threshold happens at 50% of their VO2 max, where this green individual's lactate threshold is gonna happen at 65% of their VO2 max. And because they're not that far off from each other as far as their VO2 maxes go, this makes quite a big a bit of a difference because the actual difference between the exercise intensities, so the work rates at these at these lactate thresholds, is going to be about eight percent. So the person, the green person here, is going to be able to exercise at about eight percent higher work rate without feeling fatigued, without having a, a large buildup of acids in their body, um, and without a large buildup of lactate in their body as well. And so they can maintain a higher exercise intensity without those feelings of fatigue than the person with the higher view to max just because they have the higher lactate threshold or a better term here probably the higher anaerobic threshold. All right, so let's talk more about the lactate or anaerobic thresholds. So let's put a little more of a definition on what I mean when I say anaerobic threshold. So an anaerobic threshold is basically the, the exercise intensity where anaerobic metabolism exceeds aerobic metabolism to such an extent so it's not just getting over it, but it has to be to such an extent where it's going to greatly reduce the exercise tolerance or the time to exhaustion, which is what I was talking about in the previous slide. So 
having a higher anaerobic threshold means that you can stay at, at a higher intensity without getting exhausted. And that's important for endurance-based sports because most of the race is spent at or around these anaerobic thresholds. Um, so to show a, an example here of a lactate threshold, we have somebody increasing their exercise intensity, approaching their sort of estimated, in this case, this is estimated VO2 max. It'd be the same if it was a measured VO2 max though. And we have their blood laxity on the y-axis. And so you can see here's their resting blood laxity level. It's around one or so. And it uh, sort of just kind of marches along, doesn't really change a whole lot all the way up until this person's lactate threshold around 66.8% of their, their predicted VO2 max. So you can see their resting lactate here was around one or so, and it stayed fairly close to that all the way up until their lactate threshold, which happened around 66, 67% of their maximal ability. And at that point in time, it just kind of skyrockets. And that's what I mean when I say a lactate threshold. So it's that point in time where the blood lactate, the measurable lactate, because um, we can't really measure in the muscle without taking chunks of the muscle out, but we can measure the blood pretty easily. But it's the that measurable blood lactate starts to rise rapidly as we continue to increase exercise intensity. Untrained individuals have a lactate threshold somewhere between 50 and 60% of their VO2 max typically, where trained individuals is a little higher, somewhere between 65 and 80% of their VO2 max, which means they're going to be able to exercise at a higher exercise intensity without having this large spike in lactate, which is also accompanied by a simultaneous large increase in uh, blood and muscle acidity um, in the lactate, in the acid. Um, from various sources is going to decrease extra performance and mean you have to slow down. So you don't want to cross your anaerobic threshold um, during an endurance-based uh, uh, athletic event until the very end, maybe the, you know, the kick at the end of the race. Um, because once you cross it, your ability to maintain the exercise intensity for very long is going to be very, very limited. It's going to be a short period of time before you have to slow down. So let's talk about another type of anaerobic threshold. Let's talk about the Venezuela threshold, which tends to happen around the same point as the lactate threshold. And uh, there's a re reason for that. They're kind of tied to each other um, roughly. And so the ventilatory threshold is the point in time where our ventilation starts to increase at an exponential rate. Um, so similar to this, uh, it doesn't have a flat line. Your, your ventilation kind of creeps up slowly and then all of a sudden it, it exponentially increases, kind of like what's being shown here, but with lactate, it, it's fairly flat up until that, that threshold point. Um, but anyway, so the, the ventilatory threshold is when ventilation increases rapidly at a much faster rate than it would it did at lower intensities of exercise. So what causes the ventilatory threshold? It's the body and specifically the blood trying to buffer the acid that's being released into your blood through uh, during the exercise bout. And so it's the bicarbonate buffering pathway that's trying to buffer that acid that ends up producing extra CO2 that's going to stimulate extra breathing. And so you breathe off the extra CO2 and you end up um, breathing more heavily doing that and again, causing the, the venatory threshold then. Some other anaerobic threshold assessments that can be done that we're not gonna go into detail here about, but I just want you to be aware that they exist is the heart rate deflection point, the onset of blood lactate, a maximal lactate steady state, and a critical power. So what are some uses of knowing someone's anaerobic threshold? Um, combining the anaerobic threshold with the VO2 max provides a pretty good way of predicting the performance in endurance-based sports and activities. So hopefully that makes sense to you now because I've discussed it a little bit already. Also, the anaerobic threshold provides some pretty critical information for uh, creating training programs for endurance athletes. Um, so the reason why it's so important and why it's helpful is it gives us some information about that individual's, that specific individual's bioenergetics and as when they're transitioning from different pathways and various things like that. You want to focus on some of those pathways in order to improve your ability to uh, perform in endurance-based sports. And so um, typically, uh, endurance athletes are going to do what we call threshold training. Um, there's some other names out there for this as well. And this is going to be where they specifically try to train at or near their anaerobic threshold in order to sort of boost it up over time by improving those pathways and pr improving those enzymes within those pathways and improving the energy substrate uh, storage and things like that so that you can then exercise at a higher intensity without crossing those thresholds during the actual performance.
So when we exercise at a high intensity, like what we've been talking about here, and we produce all this lactate and we produce all this acid um, separately, but you know simultaneously, uh, our bodies need to deal with that. We need to clear it out of our systems. And we also might get sore from doing this. So we might have delayed onset of muscle soreness or DOMS. The next video in this series, which I'll put a link to in the description below, is going to be talking about how our bodies remove and use lactate and also um, what causes DOMS. In this video, we're going to be talking about removing lactate from our body after intense exercise. And we're also going to be talking about muscle soreness and what causes it. We have two different ways our bodies can recover from exercise. We can do it um, passively, which basically means you just sit down and do nothing or lay down and do nothing. And then we have active recovery, which typically we call a cool down. Um, there's various reasons why you want to do a cool down. We're only going to get into one of those uh, here in this this uh, video. Um, but in looking at this, uh, we can look at the change in blood lactate over time with a passive recovery, this purple purple line here, and an active recovery, this green line. So you can see that if you do an active recovery, and what's recommended is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of your VO2 max. Um, and it needs to be low enough in order to fuel the exercise fully with aerobic metabolism, which is why it has to be a pretty low intensity. And of course, this is a little bit higher for you know elite athletes than what it is for non-elite athletes potentially, because um, they're you know their forty percent of their VO two max is higher for them, but also they might be able to do a little higher intensity relative to their own VO two max and do it aerobically. But regardless, really low intensity exercise. And it's going to um, sort of push the blood through those muscles and flood those muscles with uh, with fresh blood. And as that blood comes out into the venous side of the of the network, um, it actually carries a lot of that lactate with it, which is how the lactate gets from the muscle cells into the blood and into the bloodstream. And so. When you do that and you're sort of spreading the lactate around the body, it allows the entire body to be sort of in the process and, and, and helping out with the process of removing the lactate from the body. And so we actually remove the lactate a little bit faster when we do this and we do some sort of uh, low intensity cool down. Where if we do a passive recovery where we just sit down, the blood uh, lactate will um, Go, it'll go down over time, but it takes longer because we're not able to use the entire body to convert that lactate into various other products that eventually get you know removed from the system. And so, passive recovery requires a much longer period of time than active recovery in order to bring the lactate levels down. Um, either one, though, regardless of you do a passive or active recovery you know, by two hours or so, or, you know, 100 minutes to 120 minutes, they're going to be back down to pretty close to resting levels. But if you do an active recovery, you're going to probably be closer to resting levels around an hour, maybe a little less, maybe 40 minutes or so, um, where if you do a passive recovery, it's going to take the hour to two hours potentially to get the lactate levels all the way down because it's constantly slowly leaching out of the muscle, replenishing blood lactate levels um, because you're not flooding the muscle and getting it all out right at the beginning. And so that's the difference between a passive recovery and an active recovery for removing lactate from the body. We're talking about removing lactate. And we're talking about this very native connotation. And in a way, it kind of is because if you get too much of a lactate buildup, um, in the cell, it can slow down glycolysis, which causes you to feel fatigued and not be able to continue at a high intensity anymore. Um, but lactate itself is not necessarily a dead product. It's not a waste product. Our bodies use the lactate. It's not just thrown away. So 70% of the lactate is going to be turned back into pyruvate, which is what it was before, before it was turned into lactate. And once it's pyruvate, it can just go right into the aerobic metabolism and be used to make energy as it was originally intended when it was pyruvate before it got turned into lactate. And so it basically just gets turned right back into what it was and continues on aerobic metabolism. So 70% of it um, is is dealt with that way. So this can be done within the same cell if that if that muscle cell lowers its intensity level and lowers its uh, glycolysis rates. Um, so if it's able to get the lactate into 
the aerobic pathway, then that cell will start clearing its own lactate levels. Um, it can also allow its lactate to leak out, and uh, something uh, that's been termed the lactate shuttle means to allow the lactate to leak out of one cell that's producing a lot of lactate, and it can actually leak into another cell that's producing um, uh, not a lot of lactate and basically not producing any lactate. And so the other cell can actually utilize it because it can do this process. It can convert it back to pyruvate and then use it aerobically. And so you can actually um, use lactate from one cell in order to fuel another cell. And so as an example here, maybe a fast switch muscle fiber is going to probably produce, produce a lot of lactate, where a slow twitch muscle fiber isn't going to, and it's got a lot of aerobic metabolism. So the, the lactate can leak out of the fast switch muscle fiber and slowly sort of leak into the slow switch muscle fiber and then just be used because it's going to be converted to pyruvate and used aerobically. Another 20% of our blood lactate or our lactate in general, I should say, um, is going to be converted to glucose within the liver. All right, so looking at this diagram here, we have a muscle that's our, our example muscle. It's producing a lot of lactate. It's working really hard. And that lactate is slowly leaking out into the bloodstream where it eventually comes around to the liver. And then within the liver, it's going to be converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis. And so once it's converted into glucose, it can then be leaked back out into the blood and eventually get back to that same muscle where it can be used or a different muscle where it can be used. And so we get this cycle here that is called the Cori cycle. And the last 10% of lactate is just going to be converted into amino acids and our body is going to use it in, when it uses proteins to build up structures. Lactate is commonly blamed for causing next day muscle soreness and just sort of lay culture from various coaches and you know, fellow athletes and people like that. And um, so first off, let me just define um, the, the term that is used in order to describe the next day or two days later when you get muscle soreness. We call that DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. So it's soreness that happens 24 to 48 hours after the intense bout of exercise. Power athletes, for example, should be experiencing DOMS on a regular basis because they're doing really high intensity exercise in most of their sessions. Um, where more health-oriented individuals who aren't athletes, you know, you're a 35-year-old who's just going to the gym just to stay in shape, they really shouldn't be experiencing DOMS very often. Likewise, you know, endurance athletes and uh, people like that probably shouldn't be experiencing DOMS very often either. Um, and that's because the intensity of exercise they're doing is going to be a, a lower level than what a, a power athlete's going to do. But let me get back to talking about lactate here. So, Commonly, you hear lactic acid causes DOMS, or uh, if you don't do a cool down, you'll have a lot of lactic acid that's going to cause you to be sore the next day or you know, a couple days later. Um, so let me dismiss that myth in a few different ways here. So it, it, first off, it's not true, but let's, let's talk about how it's not true or some evidence for why it's not true. So first off, when you measure blood lactate, as we mentioned already, and this is the same figure we saw a couple uh, slides ago, it's gone, basically. It's back down to resting levels within about an hour and a half, two hours or so. And so whether you do a cool down or not, you're not going to have you know, lactate or you know, lactic acid in your body the next day causing soreness. Um, so it's probably not the cause of next day soreness um, just because lactate's gone by you know, way before then. So it's definitely you know, not going to be what's currently causing the soreness the next day. Let's talk about some other reasons why that's probably not true. Uh, so first of all, lactic acid doesn't even exist in the human body. This is something that is commonly uh, said wrong. I've said it wrong several times in myself, something I've you know learned more recently. Unfortunately, I've learned more recently, but it's something that um, is in a lot of lay media. It's also in a lot of you know, academic papers and a lot of textbooks where they talk about lactic acid in the body and it's it, what it does and and how it's you know negative for exercise performance and all that kind of stuff problem is our body doesn't produce lactic acid and it's not really capable of producing lactic acid because 
lactic acid isn't stable at the pH levels of our body and it couldn't be produced that way either. So if you look at the uh, reactions happening when our bodies make lactate, it wasn't made as lactic acid, it was made as lactate. And it's actually a good thing because it allows our glycolysis pathway to continue without having a buildup of NADH molecules and a buildup of pyruvate molecules that would actually cause it to slow down much more than what the lactate does. And the we're so a lot of people will say okay well where does the acid come from it actually comes from acp breakdown that where the hydrolysis actually produces acids and it produces hydrogen ions that don't end up going into aerobic metabolism uh, but we're not going to go into a whole lot of depth with that here just know lactic acid does not actually exist within the human body it does not get produced Lactate does, lactic acid does not. Um, they're not the same thing. So if lactate or lactic acid is not the cause for next day soreness, what is? Uh, so what is actually the cause of next day soreness is going to be microscopic injury to the muscle fibers, so the muscle cells themselves. And so if you look at an example of a sarcomere, this is a sarcomere, um, which is the the basic structural and functional unit of a skeletal muscle. This is a, a, a picture of that on a light microscope. And we have these various striations, which is the different proteins lining up the way they should. When you go through an intense exercise bout, you actually start to have little tiny tears and disruptions to this. And those tears and disruptions is what eventually causes DOMS uh, through various pathways. And it is, it's still something that's being investigated, um, but through various uh, recovery pathways and, and also the tears themselves, that is the cause of DOMS. And so if you scan this QR code here, it's going to take you to this website. Uh, so you could also type that in there. And I'll put a link to this in the description below. Um, and it's going to be a, a research paper that has a nice image. So go to figure two in that, that research paper, and it's going to show you what the sarcomeres look like. It's a little more zoomed out than this, but it's going to show the, the sarcomeres of a skeletal muscle cell after doing a, some heavy plyometric exercise. You can actually see it's kind of been torn apart in this nice striated appearance is just completely destroyed by intense exercise and, and that is what causes DOMS. It's not caused by lactic acid, it's not caused by lactate. This video talked a lot about high intensity exercise and athletic performance. In order to do those things, we need to be able to make energy in the body. I'm gonna put a link in the description below to a bioenergetics playlist that I've already created, talking about the various energy pathways. And I'm also gonna put a link in the description below to the next video in this series, where I'm gonna talk about how we measure energy production in the body and things like VO2. In this video, we're going to be talking about how we measure energy in the body. So let's go ahead and get right to it here. Let's start off by talking about calories. So one calorie or a small calorie is the energy required in order to raise one gram of water from 14.5 degrees Celsius to 15.5 degrees Celsius. If you take 1,000 of these calories, that is one kilocalorie, which is what's on the dietary labels in most countries around the world. In the United States, we don't say kilocalorie, even though that's what it is. So our dietary calorie and dietary label calories is a kilocalorie. And so another name for this would be a large calorie. And just quickly here, because it's gonna relate to how we measure energy in the body. Um, we, we learn how much energy is in food by burning the food in what's called a bomb calorimeter, which is what this is showing. So we have this little canister here, which is called the bomb, and we put the food in it, and we literally are going to burn that food in an attempt to warm up this water because it's sitting in this water bath, and then we just measure the temperature change of that water, and that's how we can calculate calories. All right, so we can do a fairly similar uh, approach in measuring the energy expended from a person as well in something that's called direct calorimetry. Here's an example of a direct calorimetry room. So in this kind of room, it, it, very similar to the bomb calorimeter, we have a person, maybe they're sitting, maybe they're you know watching television, maybe they're exercising like the example here. And in the walls of that room are pipes filled with water. And we can measure how much heat's in the water as the water goes in. We can measure how much heat's in the water as the water comes out. And so we know the change in temperature of the water. And that change in temperature came from the person that's inside the room heating up the air, which eventually heats up the walls and then heats up the water. And so this is how we can directly measure 
the energy used and the energy expended by the body, in called which is why it's called direct calorimetry. The body has a fairly stable ratio of how much of its energy is dissipated off into heat versus useful energy. So about 40% of our energy is going to turn into ATP, which is our useful energy well 60% of our energy is going to be turned into heat which would then go through this process heating up the the water that we would measure and so you can use this fairly standard ratio in order to figure out how much energy this person's using even though not all the energy is turning into heat so there's some pros and cons to using direct calorimetry in order to measure people the main pro it is it's pretty accurate over a relatively long recording time um, and it's good for doing resting measurements or uh, sort of living measurements when a person's living in the space right so you know allow them to kind of go about their day uh, a little bit in this tiny little room maybe it's, you know sitting on a computer or something like that and you can measure how much energy that they use doing that the cons to it is it's very expensive it takes a long time to do um, and obviously it takes a lot of space. Uh, there's a lot of error if you start throwing exercise equipments in there that might have friction, think treadmills and the belt going around and all the friction that's going to cause and the heat that that's going to cause. Um, sweating also causes errors in this because as we sweat, we are going to uh, dissipate heat through means that isn't just the heat radiating off our body, it's uh, going to evaporate off, which is going to change the way that the, the sort of heat uh, from our body heats up the room. And let's face it, this is just not a practical method of measuring um, the body, and it's certainly not going to be practical for measuring exercise. And so it's very rarely that uh, people still use direct calorimetry rooms in order to do this. It can be done, it does get done, but it's rare. If somebody wants to measure free living energy expenditure, they're probably gonna use a technique called doubly labeled with water, um, which is a little more um, complicated to get into, so we're not gonna get into it here, but it's another method of measuring um, uh, energy usage, but it, it's typically used over longer periods, you know, days, weeks, not so much hours, which is what a direct calorimetry room would be probably pretty good at. So instead of doing direct calorimetry, we do what we call indirect calorimetry, where we're not measuring body heat anymore. And so instead of using body heat, we measure gas changes. All right, so um, the we can do this uh, using equipment like what we see here, where there's usually some sort of face mask or a mouthpiece that has to go in the mouth. And what we do is we actually collect all the air that comes out of the person and we put it through a tube and it goes to a, a metabolic cart like this one here, where it is then going to um, be analyzed so we can figure out how much oxygen and how much CO2 is in that air. If you wanna learn how you can use a cart like this, you can scan this QR code or type in this link here. I'll also put a link to this in the description below. Um, this is a video I did a while back showing how to use a metabolic cart in order to measure VO2. So how does this all work? We know the basic um, ratios of gases in the atmosphere, no matter where you are on Earth, it's about the same level. So the same, uh, the same percentage of oxygen, the same percentage of CO2. And so if we know how much oxygen and CO2 is in the room, which we do, um, and we measure it coming out of the body, we can figure out how much oxygen was used by how much oxygen is not there, so basically how far it dips below atmospheric levels. And we can measure how much CO2 is produced by how much CO2 increases above atmospheric levels of CO2. And so based on, again, knowing how much is in the atmosphere and how much comes out of the body, we can figure out um, things like VO2 and VCO2. So VO2 is the volume of oxygen inspired, so brought into the body, minus the volume of oxygen expired from the body. So what is the difference between the two? That is your VO2 or oxygen consumption. The CO2 um, is how much CO2 is produced, and these are both per minute. And so this is going to be VCO2 equals volume of the expired CO2 minus the volume of inspired CO2. So again, figuring out that difference, it's going to be a greater number here, and that is going to be the CO2 that your body produced. So what are the pros and cons of using this indirect calorimetry method? So the, the main pro is it's accurate for um, steady state oxidative metabolism, or so aerobic metabolism over short periods of time. So unlike doing the direct calorimetry where we needed them in the room for you know multiple hours in order to get that heat exchange. Here we can hook the machine up and once they're at a steady state, 
we can take measurements, you know, breath by breath and average them for 15 seconds up to about a minute, which is the pretty standard range. And you typically don't want to go less than 15 seconds, but you know, 15 seconds to a minute averages is going to give you a nice stable value that's going to be pretty accurate. So what are the cons here? It requires some uh, fairly elaborate equipment, some expensive equipment, not as expensive as an entire room constructed for a uh, direct calorimetry, um, but still expensive. Um, it does not measure anaerobic energy production. So direct calorimetry can measure heat regardless if it was aerobic or anaerobic energy. This cannot, this can only measure aerobic energy production, but at rest and during some maximal exercise, a large percentage of our exercise uh, energy usage is aerobic, so it's still a pretty good measurement. Um, and it's, you know, as I already mentioned, it's it's still pretty expensive. These machines cost, you know, twenty to thirty thousand dollars typically, if not more. So it's a fairly expensive piece of equipment. So if you're looking at uh, information on VO2, and you're going to see terms like VO2 max and VO2 peak. Um, the next video in this series is going to be talking about, about what is the difference between a VO2 max and a VO2 peak. Um, so I'll put a link in the description below this video for that. I'll also put a link in the description below this video to a series, a, a playlist that I have doing various fitness calculations. If you look through that playlist, you'll see a lot of calculations talking about VO2 and various things you can do with VO2, including calculating the number of calories the person uses um, at, a, at a certain exercise intensity based on VO2. In this video, we're going to be describing various terms we often hear when we're talking about oxygen consumption or VO2, so VO2 max versus VO2 peak, as well as a relative VO2 max or absolute VO2 max. Starting with absolute VO2 max, the units are going to be liters of oxygen per minute of activity that you've done. And so um, it's called absolute because it's not made relative. So it's kind of the opposite of relative, really. And so, um, this is going to be the, the when you measure VO2 in this way, it's going to increase with the size of the body of the person. And so a large person's always going to have a greater absolute VO2 max than a smaller person, regardless of their fitness level. And when you measure VO2 max, what you're really trying to measure typically is their fitness level. So you can't use the absolute values in order to compare people because it's not going to be fair. Again, the big person's always going to have a higher absolute VO2 max than the small person. And so what do we do? We make it relative to their body mass. So we make it relative to their total body mass. So the units for relative VO2 are milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute of activity. And so now this is something that we can compare between people because it's been made relative to the size of their body. So some normative values here, and there, there you should look up a norm table if you want to learn more. There's lots of norm tables out there that show percentile ranks and give categorical ranks like good, average, things like that. But pretty average normal um, for untrained young men would be 44 to 50 mLs per kg per minute, where for women, would be 38 to 42 mLs per kg per minute. And so notice that women are a little bit lower. The primary reason for this is the fact that women have greater body fat percentage and body fat is um, essentially sort of dead weight. It's not highly metabolically active. And so when you're talking about your VO2 max and you're trying to make it relative to total body mass, the more fat you make it relative to, the more non-metabolically active tissue you're making it relative to. So it's going to make the person look like they have a lower VO2 max than if they were to maybe make it relative to just lean muscle mass, which some people sometimes do, but it's typically more in research settings. It's not typically done in fitness settings. So talking about VO2 max, let's talk about the difference between VO2 max and VO2 peak. They're very similar concepts, but they're not the same. All right, so a VO2 peak is just the highest value attained during a graded exercise test. So in other words, we have a test like this where we have an increasing work rate over time. So typically every few minutes, it gets harder and harder and harder. And we have an increase in oxygen consumption or VO2 as we increase that intensity. So whatever the highest value seen during that test, so whenever they stopped, that is their VO2 peak. And there's no question about it, okay? Problem is, was it their best effort? 
Could they have done better? You know, did they sleep well last night? Were they feeling a little sick today? Anything that is going to make it not their best effort is going to make it not a VO2 max, and it's going to make it a VO2 peak. So basically, then I just define what a VO2 max is. It is the highest value attained during a true maximal effort, so their best they could do at their current fitness level. So every test has a VO2 peak. Not every test has a, it reaches VO2 max, though. So when you have a VO2 max, the VO2 max and the VO2 peak are the same thing. Um, so we need to have criterion for when we determine this is truly a VO2 max and not just a VO2 peak. And so there's various criterion out there, but what I have listed down here is a fairly common set of criterion. And usually what you would say is you have to meet all or maybe you know four of the six or something like that of the criterion in order to say, yes, this was a VO2 max. And it's going to vary based on the research study you look at and based on the you know the source and uh, in, in your situation, what you can measure on the person on how many of the criterion you measure, as well as how many of the criterion they have to hit in order to say it is a VO2 max. Um, so let's go through these common criteria real quick. So a leveling off of VO2 despite an increasing work rate. So, so there's a little leveling that took place right at the end of the exercise test. That is what I mean by leveling. So an increase of less than 1.5 liters per minute or less than 2.1 mLs per kg per minute despite an increase in exercise uh, intensity. So going up a stage in exercise intensity on a test like a Bruce protocol or something like that. Another criterion is a blood lactate level greater than eight millimoles per liter of blood. Another one would be a respiratory exchange ratio or an RER equal to or greater than 1.1. Another one being a peak heart rate that is within 10 beats of the age predicted maximum heart rate of what you would expect. And then a failure of heart rate to increase with an increase, a further increase in workload. So similar to this sort of plateau, at the very end, your heart rate also tends to plateau as well. And then the last one listed here is an RPE, so a rating of perceived exertion of a 17 on the 6 to 20 Borg, Borg scale or greater than 7 on the 0 to 10 scale for RPE. So all of these are going to make it, if you achieve these, it's going to make it more likely that it was a true VO2 max, the best effort you could have done, you know, highly motivated effort, and you, you know, weren't sick or anything like that as well. I'll put links in the description below on how to measure blood lactate as well as how to measure um, heart rate and um, how to do age predicted maximum heart rates and a, a link on a video I've done on what is RPE and sort of how to use RPE just in case these any of these are new concepts for you. Let's talk a little more about VO2 peak and how it relates to the amount of muscle mass involved in the exercise. So Basically, the greater the muscle mass that is involved in the exercise, the greater the VO2 peak is going to be. And this is also one of the reasons why you can't typically have a VO2 max when using smaller amounts of muscle mass during the exercise. So something like arm ergometry, most people can't do a VO2 max on that. Most people also can't do a VO2 max on an exercise bike or leg ergometry bike. Um, so typically a treadmill or something where it's more of a full body exercise is what we need in order to get a true VO2 max. Um, but to just compare these three modalities of exercise, the VO2 peaks tend to be about 5 to 11% greater on a treadmill than on a leg ergometer. The leg ergometer tends to be about 30% greater than on the arm ergometer, and the arm ergometer tends to have the lowest of at least these these methods of exercise here is in terms of the peak VO2 that can be reached. And the reason for this is because larger, large amount of muscle mass here, more of a moderate amount of muscle mass here, and a fairly small amount of muscle mass involved in the arm ergometer. Again, the larger the amount of muscle mass, the greater the VO2 peak is going to be. The reason why the larger muscle mass results in greater VO2 peak is there's just more muscle that's consuming oxygen, and there's high metabolism and more more cells of the body allowing for more oxygen in total to be used. Whenever possible, it's great to be able to do a true measured VO2 max. Um, however, uh, measuring VO2 max is you know, complicated. It requires a graded exercise test all the way to max, which not everybody's able or willing or comfortable doing expensive equipment, highly trained personnel in order to run that equipment. Um, uh, and so this just isn't always something that's possible. What do you do though if you can't do a measured VO2 max? 
you do an estimated VO2 max. The estimating VO2 max is easier, it's cheaper, and it's usually done with submaximal tests. Not always, but usually it is. And so it's often safer for somebody who shouldn't be going all the way to maximal exercise for health or safety reasons of some sort. Um, so usually um, people are going to do an estimated VO2 max, not a true measured. So estimated VO2 maxes are actually much more common than measured VO2 maxes. Um, keep in mind though, measurements are better. Estimates are gonna have extra error because it's it's an estimate. There's a lot of different variables of how things could go wrong with an estimate. So they're not gonna be quite as good as a measurement. So when you're doing a VO2 max, you're not always just doing it just to get what the maximum oxygen consumption is. You are oftentimes doing it in order to learn a little about the RER because the RER or the respiratory exchange ratio can tell you how much of each fuel you're using. So how much carbohydrates, how much fats you're using. So the next video in this series is going to be talking about the RER, the respiratory exchange ratio. And so I'll put a link in the description below this video for that as well. In this video, we're going to be talking about the respiratory exchange ratio or the RER, which is a measurement we often do when using a metabolic cart to measure something like a VO2 max. And it's something that can tell us how much of each of carbohydrates or fats we're using to do the exercise that we're currently measuring. So again, the respiratory exchange ratio or the RER, oftentimes this is just abbreviated R as well, is going to be a measurement that's gonna be done during a VO2 test of some sort. And so it is the VCO2, so how much carbon dioxide is produced, versus the VO2 as a ratio, VO2 being the, how much oxygen is used. So how much CO2 is made divided by how much O2 is used. Doing this allows us, again, to figure out how much carbohydrates we're using and how much fats we're using. Remember, our body doesn't use a lot of protein for our metabolism in order to actually make energy. And so... We typically ignore it when we're doing these sort of estimates. Looking at this graph here, the x-axis has the respiratory exchange ratio starting at 0.7, which is typically about the lowest you're going to see at rest, going up to equal to or greater than 1.0, which is what we see at around peak exercise or maximal exercise. And then on the y-axis, we have the percentage of the total energy um, being used um, aerobically that is... Uh, contributed from either fats as the purple line or the green line, which is carbohydrates. And so you can see the two cross over time. So as exercise intensity is increased, we use less and less fat, more and more carbohydrates. At an RER of about one, we're using pretty much completely carbohydrates. Where at the RER of 0.7, we're using almost entirely fats. And so let's talk about how these calculations work and how we do this. So looking at the RER for fat, and we're going to use um, the common fatty acid, palmitic acid, as our example here, it is C16H32O2. So as we oxidize or burn this fatty acid, we're going to be adding oxygen and on the other side of the equation. So on the yielding side of the equation, we're going to be getting CO2, we're going to be getting H2O, and energy, ATP. Um, and so we need to balance this equation so that we add the right amount of oxygen in order to get the right amount of CO2 and H2O because all these have to be balanced. We can't have any leftover carbons, hydrogens, or oxygens when we do this. So if you balance this equation just right for palmitic acid, you end up with 16 CO2s and 23 O2s. And so if you do that math for the, the R value or the respiratory exchange ratio, remember that's CO2 um, produced divided by oxygen consumed, you end up getting 0.70 the beginning of our scale here where it's mostly fat. If you do the same process for glucose, which is carbohydrate, uh, glucose is C6H12O6, um, you have to add six O2 molecules in order to get six CO2 molecules, and then we'll end up with six H2Os and some ATP, which is our energy. And so you do that same RER equation here, that R equation, the CO2 produces six, the O2 consumed is also six, so six divided by six is one, which is the top end of our scale here, where um, again, we're using all carbohydrates and essentially no fat in order to fuel aerobic metabolism. Notice though here, we have equal to or greater than one on the, the x-axis. So let's talk about 
how we can have greater than one for an RER. So we once we hit one, we're using 100% carbohydrates in order to fuel aerobic metabolism. Um, however, we can still produce more CO2 beyond that. And the way we do that is by buffering the acids produced with exercise using the bicarbonate buffering pathway. And so the bicarbonate buffering pathway actually produces CO2 that we breathe off in order to lower the acidity of the blood. And so this is an extra source of CO2 beyond just the regular bioenergetic um, CO2 that we would produce in order to get to that, one, that ratio of one. And so we end up with a ratio above one, which is the reason why a, a true VO2 max is going to have an RER of about 1.1 one or greater because it's going to require us to push ourselves to the point of having a fair amount of acid in our blood and a lot of anaerobic metabolism as well in order to get that true VO2 max. This was just one video in a series of videos on exercise metabolism. I'll put a link in the description below for the playlist to that full series. I'll also put a link in the description below to the playlist I've made on bioenergetics, which is how we basically make energy in the body and the various pathways for making energy in the body. And I'll also add a link in the description below to a video where I've shown how to use a metabolic carton to actually measure VO2, which is how you would measure RER as well.